Uh, on behalf of the Center for Constitutional Law Studies, of which I am not a part, uh, 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 welcome to this uh, morning session uh, where we have two guests from the Melbourne Law School, uh, of which I continue to be a part uh, still. Uh, uh, welcome, Pip and Tarun. Uh, today's session is going to be organized in this way. Uh, we'll have uh, Pip Nicholson, uh, uh, who will go first, to introduce uh, some of the broad research areas that Melbourne Law School is interested in, and this might be something that students particularly, as well as some of our faculty, uh, might take something away from. Um, that will be followed by a brief Q&A, um, and we'll then go directly into uh, uh, Tarunab's presentation, uh, whose title is up, and I can't read it very clearly, but clearly you can, oh, it's here as well. Um, it's a paper by uh, Tarun, which has already been published, and he'll give us a sense of uh, some of its key arguments, and then we'll again open up for Q&A. Um, very briefly, so that we can make most of the time that we have on hand, uh, Professor Pip Nicholson is the dean of the Melbourne Law School, and Tarun is currently a future fellow at Melbourne Law School, uh, and on leave from his position as associate professor at uh, Oxford University. I'll uh, keep the introductions brief, um, because uh, if you go onto their website profiles, you will find uh, details of their uh, you know, checkered uh, careers, including uh, the publications uh, that, that they have worked on. So over to Pip. I'm just checking it's morning, and it is still morning, so good morning to you all. My name is Pip Nicholson, as Oishik correctly pointed out, and I am the Dean of Melbourne Law School. And a part of my chequered career, which you can find on the website, Oishik and I go back a long way, so I'm delighted with that introduction, is that I was previously the director of the Melbourne Law School's Asian Law Centre for about five years. And it's really in the capacity of introducing staff and students to the Asia-focused scholarship that I want to interject myself for a few minutes before Tarun gives his paper on directive principles. So a very good morning to you all, and thank you very much for having me. I might also take this opportunity to thank Jindal generously for hosting us and for enabling us to continue the conversation that is the bedrock of uh, institutional relationships. I first visited Jindal in 2014, in fact on the week of the election of the current government and students were rushing furiously between classes to catch the election update and we floated seamlessly about looking at the industry and activism that was very palpable on the campus at that stage in which I'm sure is thriving and I hear from your leaders is thriving. Let me talk to you briefly then about the research and teaching focus of the Melbourne Law School on Asian jurisdictions broadly, but then particularly its emerging work in the context of its scholarship research and teaching on India. So the Asian Law Centre was set up uh, 31 years ago and had as its initial jurisdictions of focus or target Japan and then over time increased its jurisdictional focus to include, not surprisingly, China and Indonesia. And while the members of the Asian Law Centre agitated for a very long period for the appointment of scholars that took India as their focus, the institution lagged a little behind us. But about seven years ago, uh, professor, Associate Professor Farah Ahmed joined the Asian Law Centre as the director of its first India program. Now, just watching how those jurisdictional expertises evolved across time gives you a snapshot or an account of the geopolitical and economic focus of the Australia-Asian engagement. It commenced its engagement through a very strong focus on economic cooperation with Japan, obviously also 
more recently over the last 20 years with China, and then Indonesia throughout, both economically, geopolitically. To adapt to a moment in time 30 years later when Australian leadership still tries to argue we are of the region, while at the same st stage those of us in academia would argue we are partly of the region and also partly insufficiently knowledgeable about the region and hence our commitment to the India program most recently. So as I said to you, Farah was appointed seven years ago and then more recently Tarun Kaitan, from whom you will hear soon, uh, joined her and together uh, with other colleagues who are seated in this room, there has been an emerging and now very concrete program to foster scholarship and the study of Indian legal issues across different domains. So be they doctrinal, critical legal theory, or socio-legal. So the scholarship methodologically uh, moves from all three vantage points, which I think is critical to a sophisticated understanding of an extraordinarily complex and diverse <laughs> jurisdiction like India. Um, Taron and Farah were joined most recently by Jeff Redding, who has uh, an interest in law and religion and family law and also in formal dispute resolution in India and also in Pakistan, hence developing a more South Asia focus and an exclusive focus on India. And they've also been joined by Adil Khan, who is working uh, across a range of issues. Doctoral researchers at the law school look at law and religion in India World Trade Organisation and Law, International Law, Law and Gender, and um, Indian Investment Treaties. So as you can see from that suite of issues, an extraordinarily broad range indeed, and includes such wonderful young scholars, scholars as Darshan Tata, Neha Mishra, your very own Oishik Sirkar, who continues his association with us, and uh, Debelina Dutta and Robbie Rada. Um, Later this year, they will be joined by Aradhya Setia, who's from Yale and has a Fox Fellowship to come and look at Indian constitutional law while cited with the scholars that look generous, generously at comparative constitutional law at the law school. So in brief, what I want to do to you today is put before you, if you like, front of mind, the possibility of building on the um, relationships and scholarship that we are developing on India and invite some of you who might be thinking about uh, further academic study to consider either our master's program, and I'll talk briefly about that in a moment, but also our doctoral program, and concurrently our institutions are working together to look at ways to better foster some linkages. Just before I turn to the master's program, what I've talked to you about so far is those scholars and doctoral students who have an India focus in their scholarship. They sit within a law school, which is 161 years old, uh, that has a very uh, large commitment, a, an absolute commit commitment, if you like, or a bedrock commitment to be open and outward looking. And I think uh, our work at the Asian Law Centre, our Centre for Comparative Constitutional Law, our sports law program, our world trade program, are all symptomatic of the fact that Australians live at the bottom of the world on an island. And I think that's often forgotten. And when you live at the bottom of the world on an island, you are absolutely committed to coming to understand the world around you, and in our case, in particular, uh, the world of Asia and its very complex political geographies, economic geographies, and intellectual legal pluralism. And whether scholars join an India-focused program or join another research stream of the law school, they can be confident that they will be moving in a community of scholars that are very open-minded and very supportive. And I guess the most uh, concrete example of that is Tarun's most recently established Indian Equality Law Program, where Tarun, I'm pleased to say, 
won the Latin Prize uh, and has decided to devote the proceeds of that prize to supporting a three-year uh, doctoral scholarship and a program for visiting scholars. And this breeds a range of opportunities uh, for, for many people, uh, one or several of whom may be in the room at this time. So let me speak for a, for a brief moment about the Masters and then Q&A if you've got any questions around any aspect of the law school. One of the things I'm proudest about, about of in the Masters is its breadth. We offer over uh, 160 to 180 subjects every year across 23 specialist areas of law and to students from 40 different countries. Uh, and the staffing of that program is broadly my own faculty and then 70 international experts and a range of leading practitioners. Now, the details about this program are up on the website and you can explore that as and when you will. But one of the things that is symptomatic of the Melbourne Law Masters program is the diversity of its student group, the diversity of its staff and the diversity of its intellectual offerings, which I think are attractive to many of the students that join us from around the globe. We do have a high participation rate in the Masters from Asia, but similarly we have a high participation from South America, Europe and Canada. And it, that diversity is, I think, one of the hallmarks of the peer-to-peer, student-to-student experience, which um, I know that our own students value very highly. I think that's probably enough about the Melbourne Law School and its master's program. The one comment I will make is that many of those who, well not many, but some of those who come to us through the master's program stay on with us in the doctoral program or indeed go on to other fabulous doctoral programs around the globe. And I think to the extent that we are as a community of scholars and teachers contributing to the broadest possible uh, contributions to legal knowledge and scholarship, that is a wonderful result. So for those of you who are thinking about an academic path or indeed upskilling for a particular practitioner role, remember you can always be in touch with us and ask specific questions about what that path might look like and how difficult or manageable it might be to chart. So uh, open for questions if you've got any. Oh my goodness. Um, I'm not particularly good at propaganda, but Taran has reminded me of uh, a critical aspect that I should encourage you to consider if you want to come and do the Masters with us, and that is that Melbourne Law School has determined to put three fee relief Masters scholarships, make three fee relief Masters scholarships available only to Indian students per year. So those of you thinking of applying to the Masters should indicate that you wish to apply for the Alex Chernoff Scholarship, named after a former governor who indeed has been instrumental in charting the relationship between Australia and India in terms of the University's Australia India Institute. Indicate that you are applying also for that scholarship. And if successful, it means that all fees for your program of study would be waived. Further, the law school has committed to seeking to find ways in which we can assist the students from India to fund their um, living and accommodation. We understand fees isn't the only impost when you've come to study in another jurisdiction. And so we've put research assistance scholarships in place where you work for a fee, but we guarantee you an income of 10,000 Australian dollars while you're with us in the hope that that will offset some of or defray some of the living costs. Concurrently, you can be assured I am working tirelessly to try and find a generous <coughs> philanthropist who will actually make uh, a full living cost uh, scholarship available to accompany the fee relief. But at this point, we put before you the fee relief scholarship and also uh, a contribution to defray your living costs through the research assistance work program. Now, do you have any questions? Thank you, Tara. Yeah, it's a good question.
question. So the question is, how important is it to graduate from the <coughs> master's program if you want to be competitive in the doctoral program? That will in large part depend on the totality of your application. Um, where a student has completed an undergraduate LLB, we would usually look for a master's qualification before admission to the doctoral program. Whereas a student has graduated from a graduate law degree, we may waive that consideration depending <coughs> on what the transcript reveals by way of familiarity and demonstrated capacity in sustained pieces of legal research. So it will vary from individual transcript to individual transcript. That might be it. Okay. Tyler, can I invite you to give a lecture on directive principles and the expressive accommodation of ideological dissent? So thank you all for turning up. Uh, there was no attendance, so I, I'm assuming that you're all here by choice and not, not in the duress. But if you are here in the duress, please feel free to leave at any point. Uh, I'm not going to take it personally. Um, I'm also hoping that this is going to be interactive. There will be Q&A time at the end, but but you should absolutely feel free to raise your hands at any point during the talk to ask questions or clarifications or further information. So, um, so this is a talk about making constitutions and, and about how we can make constitutions that last. Quantitative research on, on the lives of constitutions, something we need to take with a grain of salt, but for what it's worth, some scholars who like doing this sort of thing have calculated that the average life of a constitution is about 19 years. Now that's, I don't know if that surprises you, of course, in our collective imagination, the American model with a constitution that has perhaps lasted more than it should have uh, looms large, and therefore 19 years seems quite, quite a short period for documents that are aspirationally enduring. The point of constitutions, unless they're designed to be interim constitutions, the point of constitutions is to provide a stable framework for governance for a long time to come. The reason why this may not be surprising, what in my view is a very short lifespan of an average constitution is this. There is a problem with drafting constitutions in deeply divided societies. Most pluralistic societies of our time are becoming well, more pluralistic and also more deeply divided. Now the problem is that while constitutions aspire to last, a, not while, but because constitutions aspire to last a very long time, the victors and the losers in constitutional negotiations know that their victories and their losses are also going to endure. When you lose in ordinary politics, you at least have the solace that that defeat is reversible. Some point down the, life, uh, down the line, assuming a broadly functional democracy, you might win power and you can reverse those changes. But constitutional losers lose for a very long time. There's also research that demonstrates that constitutions that last are constitutions which are framed with a very broad consensus. This is something that Sujit Chaudhary has called the stability constraint for constitution making. The idea is simply this, that if you want to create a stable constitution, you must get every politically salient group 
which basically means every political group that can upset the apple cut, every political group that can unravel the constitutional negotiation must sign up to the Constitution. Right? So the idea is that if a group is politically powerful enough, if not to, need not be a majority group, right? powerful salient minorities must sign up to a Constitution. You have to secure their buy-in for the Constitution to be stable, for the Constitution to last. Now, there's a lot of scholarship, not so much in India, there's a little bit in India, but, but uh, in global constitutional theory, there's a lot of scholarship on accommodation of ethno-cultural minorities. Ethno-cultural minorities being minorities defined by their race or ethnicity or religion. These tend to be the salient features around which we see social cleavages in deeply divided societies. These are groups that have secessionist ambitions. And liberal constitutional scholarship has a long tradition of thinking about how to accommodate powerful ethnocultural minorities, how to get their buy-in into the constitutional settlement. There are various design models that have been proposed, but very briefly, there are the, most of them fall into two broad categories. And forgive the jargon, some of you may already be familiar with this, but one set of institutional design solutions seek what is often called consociationalism. Consociationalism takes these ethnocultural cleavages, these group distinctions as given, and basically give a political insurance to the minority, a guarantee of political power. What are the minorities afraid of? They are, af they are afraid of being locked out of power in a democratic system, in a majoritarian democratic system. What consociational solutions do is give them some assurance that they will not be locked out in this way. Right? There will be some modicum of power they will have access to. There are various ways of doing this. The usual example given is the Northern Irish model, where the decision-making processes are designed such that at least on a certain group of controversial decisions, the Catholics and the Protestants have to agree for the state to be able to do anything. Right? So that's one way of doing consociationalism. If the minorities are regionally concentrated, like in Sri Lanka, federalism may also work as a consociational tool, which is why you can see why the federal debates, federalism debates in Sri Lanka are so critical uh, to, the, uh, to, to, the, to the latest round of constitution-making efforts a constitution revising efforts. So that's one type, one category of accommodation tools that's out there in the literature and that you can see in the practice. The second type of tool can broadly be described as centripetalism. Now centripetalism also seeks to give minorities a share in political power, but not as minorities. What centripetalism seeks to do is to design institutions in a way such that only groups that can speak to a broad coalition, only parties that can speak to a broad coalition of social groups will ever secure power. So the Australian voting system, for example, in a deeply divided society, can be a centripetal tool, where um, um, so the Australian system they do, they they have a constituency-based electoral system, but instead of casting one vote in favor of one person, you have a preferential system where you can rank the candidates that you support, 
And some, there's some research, there's a scholar called Benjamin Riley who's done a fair amount of research who shows that in order to get, in order to be elected, parties need not only to be the first preference of voters, but also to be their second and third preferences, which forces them to speak to a broader constituency, which forces them to speak to a constituency beyond what they might have narrowly. So under first past the post, you can win on a plurality of votes. Under a preferential model, you have to speak to, and basically the preferential model roots out radical groups. By radical, I mean radical on, uh, on ethnocultural politics. Groups that only try to speak to one particular constituency are likely to be the first preference of some voters, but the last preference of other voters, and therefore they're unlikely to win the agenda. So this is a, a very different way of doing things. This is a centripetalist agenda which does not take social identities as given and tries to build coalitions across different communities. So anyway, these are the two broad models of accommodating ethnocultural groups in a liberal constitution to give them a stake in political power and ensure that no politically salient group will be locked out of power for a very long time. What the scholarship has not paid sufficient attention to so far and what I've tried to do in this paper is to think about a different type of minority, not defined well, there are, of course, overlaps, but these are not minorities necessarily defined by their ethnocultural identity. These are ideological groups. These are groups that essentially reject liberal constitutionalism as a, as a framework for organizing governance. Right? Now, of course, this paper is limited to liberal constitutional traditions, right? So I've, I'm not making any claims outside that tradition. Of course, there's a lot of work on it, and Pip is actually an expert on socialist traditions. If any of you are interested, please speak to her. But within the liberal tradition, how does liberalism, how does liberal constitutionalism accommodate groups that reject liberal constitutionalism itself? That is the project of this paper. And what, what I've tried to do in this paper is to look closely at the Indian debates to see how the Indian framers went about doing this. So that's the story I'm going to tell you. Of course, in the Indian constitution making, a whole range of other tools were used, especially a lot of consociational tools. You know, the current debates we are having on, on Article 35A, on 370, these are all, these are all one way of thinking about, about the special status of Kashmir, about uh, uh, political reservations for Dalits and scheduled tribes. These, one way of thinking about it is to see them as political insurance for groups who would have otherwise rejected the constitutional settlement and therefore refused to partake in it and, and may well be the reason for the relative stability, although we live in difficult times, but the relative stability of the Indian constitution. But anyway, that's, that's, that's a story that you're probably aware of and I'm not going to dwell very much on that just yet. The story I'm going to tell you is about ideological dissenters. Now, this is an audience I don't need to give very much background on, the drafting of the Indian Constitution, but a very quick overview. Late 1940s, the Constituent Assembly is elected in 1946 on a limited franchise and indirect elections. Not directly elected by the people, but by representatives and franchise limited by colonial rules on education and property on, on a whole variety of other things. And deeply self-aware of its own lack of legitimacy. Remember this is also a time when the Muslim League has walked out. Partition happens within the first year of the assembly. And the government has only just gone about the task of pulling in 500 odd princely states within the Union of India, right? So things are not looking particularly great. The British Empire has left in a tearing, if not a criminal hurry, and there is a political vacuum, there is a, there's an, there's a leadership vacuum, well, there's a governance vacuum, not, not necessarily a leadership vacuum. Anyway, so a different Congress, the cynical view would be for strategic reasons, the normative view would be for moral reasons. The truth is probably a bit of both. 
adopts a policy of accommodation, accommodation of political rivals especially. So an example would be the invitation to, to Dr. Ambedkar to, to chair the drafting committee. Uh, having him elected on a Congress ticket after he loses his seat after partition. Anyway, so now of course, this is also, the, there's a policy of accommodation only to groups who are willing to come to the constitutional negotiation table, right? The communists who refuse to talk feel the full brunt of the state's force, right? So. Um, basically, brutal suppression of the communists because they're refusing to talk, but the socialists, the Hindu Mahasabha people, although their representation as a party is limited in the Constituent Assembly, a lot of, because the Congress itself is a broad church, a lot of Congress members themselves mouth their views and vociferously. Anyway, so I have three broad ideologically dissenting groups that the paper focuses on. The first group are the Gandhians. Remember, this is also a time when serious constitutional negotiation begins. Gandhi has already been assassinated, but his, his aura looms larger than life. Now, they see no Gandhi in the, in the draft constitution, which is published in February 1948, remains in the public domain for most of 1948, and it's taken up for second reading by the Constituent Assembly in November 1948, right? So our story begins in November 1948. The Gandhians don't see any Gandhi in the Constitution. What do they want? They want self-sufficient autarkic villages with alcohol and cow slaughter prohibition. They want radical decentralization. They have an anti-modern, anti-state agenda, right? Of course, the draft Constitution is extremely far removed from that vision. The other group, which is probably the most accommodated even within the draft constitution, but not enough by their lights, are the socialists. The draft constitution already has a few directive principles which incorporate some socialist policies, but the socialists want to go much further. They want the constitution to nationalize all natural resources. They want cooperative agriculture and industry, enforceable social rights. All of these things, the constitution empowers the central government to do, but does not do itself, and the socialists don't trust the future politicians to do it. So they want these guarantees in the Constitution. The third group which feels left out are the cultural nationalists who have a majoritarian Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan agenda. They want, and their agenda is now, of course I'm talking of them as groups, but these are not discrete groups. The individuals sometimes straddle multiple groups. Their agendas are very fluid, but so this is just a heuristic device to call them groups. They're not discrete political parties. They're from multiple parties, often from within the Congress itself. So the third group has an agenda of cow slaughter prohibition, Hindi as national language, a uniform civil code. Uh, so a, a whole series of majoritarian uh, Hindi speaking, North Indian Hindu, leaders pushing it. As soon as the draft constitution is presented before the assembly for second reading, and Dr. Ambedkar gives an introductory speech moving, moving the motion to, to adopt it, each of these three groups register vociferous protests to the motion regarding the draft constitution. And within the, the first few days of November, they, each of them moves wrecking amendments to the first few constituting articles of the Constitution. So articles one to four are the first articles that are taken up for discussion. And each of these groups moves radical amendments. Uh, for example, the cult cultural nationalists move Article 1A, which basically incorporates the entire majoritarian agenda, and sim similar moves are made by the socialists and the Gandhians. Now, this goes on until the 18th of November. So the discussion starts on the 4th of November, 18th of November. The chair on the end of the, of the day, proceedings on 18th of November, suddenly announces that tomorrow, instead of taking up citizenship, 
and fundamental rights, which were structurally the next parts of the Constitution that should have been debated, we are going to discuss directive principles. Members, some members are upset about this. Say, so why are we doing this? No explanation is forthcoming, but there are hints when Ambedkar is responding to these wrecking amendments in the first few days. He's already suggesting that directive principles will be used for some form of accommodation. So anyway, I don't have the details of why the move was made, but I have a guess that it was probably because they wanted these groups to come on board before getting into the more contentious citizen. They didn't want citizenship and fundamental rights to be wrecked by these agendas, and a decision must have been made to deal with these groups through directive principles. So the draft constitution already has a chapter on directive principles, but the largely it only contains two types of directives what we would today call the social rights directives, education, health, nutrition, et cetera, and directives on redistribution, equality reduction, stopping concentration of wealth, et cetera. Right? What happens during the debates in the, in the second half of November is this. Basically, Dr. Ambedkar makes deals with the leaders of each of the radical groups to incorporate their key demands, key policy demands, as constitutional directives. Now, this is a phenomenon, or at least I've described it as a phenomenon of constitutional incrementalism. Incrementalism is the idea of making controversial decisions step by step, gradually. What incrementalism ensures, at least in theory, is an easier acceptance of a controversial demand, where you don't seek the full, final, broad goal. You get there in small steps. Constitutional incrementalism is the idea that you defer controversial decisions from constitutional politics, which has permanent winners and losers, to ordinary politics in the future, where gains and losses are reversible. Directive principles, which enjoin the state to endeavor to seek X, Y, and Z, are a tool of constitutional incrementalism. The Constitution kicks the ball down the road. It tells the group the future state can do this and can do this politically so that victories and losses are, ir are, are reversible rather than irreversible. There are other incrementalist tools constitutions use all the time. Parliament shall by law decide the national language of the country. Right? What are you doing here? Instead of a constitution settling the national language, which is controversial, you say, let this be done by parliament, because then you can change it. Right? Strategic ambiguity, the constitution speaks in multiple voices, does not take a position. You, you allow courts and politicians later to figure things out. Sunset clauses, American slavery clause, status quo for 20 years. What does that mean? We will deal with this, but not now, because we cannot get to a constitutional arrangement if we decide to settle slavery now, right? Kick the ball down the road. 20 years later, we'll revisit it. Directive principles are also a similar deferral tool, but they're a tool of partial deferral. Unlike these other tools, they don't defer the full decision to the future. They do settle what the goal is, and they also settle whether to seek it. Right? Directives are obligations, albeit political obligations, on the state. What is deferred is the when and the how. That is for future politicians to decide. So what do you get when a controversial agenda is enshrined as a directive in the Constitution? The radical dissenters 
get a modicum of constitutional legitimacy for their agenda that they will use in the political life of the state later to buttress their policy arguments. And it is no surprise that on cow slaughter, on uniform civil code, the directives in the political discourse are constantly invoked. But that is the price the framers have paid by incorporating and therefore legitimizing these agendas within the Constitution. That is the political insurance being offered to these groups to get them to sign up to a broadly liberal constitution. This is what I've called an expressive accommodation. They don't get a guarantee of political power. But notice that ideological groups don't seek a guarantee of political power. Right? All of these groups, they don't speak for a particular section at least in their own imagination, they, each of them speaks, claims to speak for the real people of India. For the socialists, the real people of India are poor. For the Gandhians, the real people of India live in villages. For the cultural nationalists, the real people of India are Hindu. Right? And if you believe in your ideological position, you think under democratic con conditions, power will come, it's a matter of time. Contrasted with ethnocultural minorities. Ethnocultural minorities are politically pessimistic. They know they don't have the numbers. In a democracy, they want a guarantee of power by some sort of quota type arrangement or, or, or some, other, some, some other consociation or centripetal tool. These ideological groups don't seek that guarantee because they believe they are going to win. They believe their ideology is the right one. It's only a matter of time before people will see their point of view. What they, what they want is a zone of politics free of law, a zone of politics where the constitution, this liberal constitution will not stand in their way, where this constitution will not stop them from pursuing their radical agendas. So that's what they get. Why did the liberals sign up to it? Of course, I should put a footnote here. These are liberal constitutionalists. They're not politically liberal. Most of the Congress leadership is politically socialist. But they are liberal constitutionalists in the sense that they do not want the Constitution to settle state policy. They're liberal to the extent that they want elected governments of the future to decide what the policy of the state shall be. Even committed socialists like Nehru and Ambedkar constantly and repeatedly tell the assembly the economic policy of the state is for the future government to decide, not for us to settle. So why do the liberals sign up to this? Well, first, because they get these groups to sign up to a, still a largely liberal democratic constitution. Second, they can still hold out hope for defeating their agendas politically. Remember, nobody has won yet. Ambedkar, when talking about some of these directives, expresses the hope time and again that they will be enforced through consensus, only when there is political consensus, only when their advocates have convinced those who oppose them to the merits of their arguments. The liberals also support them because at least these agendas are not part of the more expressively salient parts of the Constitution. By putting them in directives and discussing the preamble later, they thwart the attempts to put these ideas in the preamble or the first four constituting articles of the state. Right? That would have given them a much greater expressive salience than directive principles. Most importantly, <clears throat> while these ideas are being constitutionalized, the liberals and largely Ambedkar also try to contain them, to defang them while translating them into constitutional codes. 
So what are these containment strategies? I'll finish in five minutes or so. First, there's a rejection of a wholesale incorporation of the ideology in the Constitution. Socialism is not going to go in. Hindu Rashtra is not going to go in. Gandhianism is not going to go in. Broad principle is not going to go in. Individual policies can. And not all your policies. One or two policies that you care most about, that are most central to your ideological position, to your plank. That alone will go in. And how do they go in? Some of the demands are diluted. So the Gandhian demand of self-government in translation becomes a constitutional directive of self-sufficiency for villages, not self-government. Right? Now, the modus operandi is extremely interesting to watch. Day one, 15 amendments presented by different leaders pushing the radical agenda. Next morning, one of them, or Ambedkar, will stand up and say, Mr. So-and-so and I have agreed on a formula which we put before the assembly and we recommend it to you. The Mr. So-and-so is usually the most moderate of the radical group. And Ambedkar has usually agreed to a formula that is contained in one of these ways. So dilution is one containment strategy. The second containment strategy is instantiation. So the most radical of the agendas do not make it as directives on their own. They do not become self-standing directives. But instead, they are put in as particular directives, as examples of more general controlling directives. So the cow slaughter directive, how does that go? The state shall endeavor to organize agriculture on modern and scientific lines, and in particular, seek a prohibition on the slaughter of cows. What does that do? It makes the particular directive in service of the general directive, which is why you see all these pseudo-scientific arguments about the value of cow and everything it produces to agriculture. Right? Because that is the only admissible reason that the, the sectarian argument has been left behind. Of course, this is window dressing to some extent, right? but there is a public value in not at least constitutionally making a sectarian argument. Right? We might be losing that culture, but anyway. Alcohol prohibition, an instance of the directive on nutrition and health, not a self-standing directive. The third containment strategy is qualification. And this is seen in the language directive, which most people don't talk about because it's not in part four of the Constitution. This is, well, I don't have the number here. It's 300s or something. There is a there's, a, an, there's another directive principle sec, section in the Constitution. In the languages chapter, there are three or four other directives which perform exactly the same function, the same language the state shall endeavor to, right? Now, part of the language settlement is Hindi is the official language, not the national language, alongside English which parliament, after 15 years, must revisit. Remember, kicking the can down the road. Parliament, of course, keeps extending it. A schedule of official languages for states. So that was a very messy compromise. But the Hindustani question, the Hindi-Urdu question, which I'm sure a lot of you know about, this is also, of course, a mirroring the Hindu-Muslim problem is solved by a language directive which says the state shall endeavor to develop Hindi by borrowing from Hindustani and Sanskrit. Right? So basically, polyvocality in the text, speaking to multiple constituencies, trying to keep everyone happy. Did this work? It's hard to say what was going on in the minds of these leaders, but if you read the report on the final day of the Constitution, several leaders of these groups point to these, leaders like Seth Govindas, point to these particular directives and say pretty much this. We don't like this Constitution very much, 
but we are willing to hold our noses and sign up to it because of these directives. Right? All but one member of the Constituent Assembly end up signing it. OK, I think I've spoken enough, so I'll, I'll stop there. But basically, the broad claim is that under certain cir circumstances, expressive accommodation of illiberal groups can also aid the stability of a constitution. Of course, it militates against the romantic idea of Bruce Ackerman of constitution making as this romantic moment where we all transcend our individual differences and come together as a polity to set our self-interest aside and do what's good for the nation. That I, I haven't seen a constitution-making process that's worked like that. It's messy. It's political. It is based on what you can get. And every group wants to hold out for as long as it can because because the very feature of endurance encourages intransigence. Why would you agree when you don't think you have had enough and you're going to have to live with it for a very long time? Right? So anyway, I'll stop there, and I'm happy to take questions on this or on my other work on equality, et cetera. Thank you very much. Ambedkar usually fixes you know, the, the detail of, of the provisions. And they get support from a very small group of Congress leadership, which is basically what you see by November 1948 is a broad commitment to the draft constitution that has emerged within this group within this leadership. And it's, it's clear that mostly what this group wants is to get this draft constitution through the assembly with minimal damage. So that, now, look, thinking about their motivations, their ideology, their politics for doing so uh, is beyond the scope of this paper, right? Because uh, you have to look at material outside the debates so I've only focused on the debates and what's visible from the debates. You, to, and you can imagine multiple motivations, right? You can imagine the motivation of <clears throat> getting things done because you know, these are you know, 
large scale violence has broken out, huge migration of people, the, the sooner they can settle the constitutional question. So part of the leadership is probably just worried about getting this done, right, and, and moving on with the election. Part of them are also worried about their own legitimacy, the longer, you know, the Socialist Party is sort of, is very equivocal in its, you know, first they decide to boycott the assembly, then they decide to join it, then they boycott it again. Some people end up in the assembly, some people are outside the assembly, Nehru is bending over backwards trying to get them in. They are challenging the leg legitimacy of an unelected assembly. They're saying you have to be elected. Nehru first gives a speech saying this will be a temporary constitution and of course we'll make a new one. And by the time they've realized how difficult it is to make any constitution, they've just decided, look, this is what we have to live with, right? So part of it could just be pragmatic and strategic, which is why you know, the, in, in the paper I've put lots of caveats around the label liberal constitutionists and defenders, right? Because it's not clear what their motivations necessarily are and, and not all of their politics is liberal. Right? Politically, most of them are socialists. But, but for whatever reason, there's a, there's a group of key Congress leaders that come together to defend this draft constitution. And, and they are the groups that are cutting deals basically to minimize the damage done, done to this. Uh, to this uh, but I'm, I'm not, by the way, this, is not, this, is, this may sound more cynical than I mean it to. I think some of them are generally committed also to the idea of, of consensus, right? They've seen, they've seen what happens when a key political player walks out. Right? Muslim League has refused to join the table and that has had disastrous consequences for the country. They know the political price they will have to pay if more people walk out, right? So, so I don't think it's, it's entirely cynical. Your second question was also a very good one on, I focused on T0. What happens at the time of framing the Constitution? Okay, you get these people to agree. I, I read your question as asking, well, is there a bigger price to pay later on, right? Is, is, this, is this sort of in the long term a bad idea? That's a very hard question to answer because it invites you to ask the counterfactual. What would the politics of cow slaughter have been without the directive, right? And there are two ways of answering that question. One counterfactual possibility is that the directives ensure that the issue stays on the agenda of the state. Even if you don't settle what will happen politically, you have set it up on the agenda, it's in the Constitution, right? You give it some legitimacy and therefore the debate keeps coming up. It doesn't go away. That's, that's a pessimistic reading. Maybe what motivated your question, right? Will, will we ever see the end of the cow slaughter debate? The optimistic reading is the debate would have happened anyway. It happened before the Constitution. It, ha it spanned throughout the colonial times. The debate would have happened anyway. The Constitution sets and limits the parameters within which it must happen. And therefore has been successful in containing the debate and the limits to which it can go. Now, as I said, these are both possibilities. I can't think of a methodology which will allow one to say which is the most more plausible counterfactual. It's it's very hard question to answer. So yeah. there were quite a few hands. Is it okay? Sure. <coughs> Can you collect two at a time or maybe three?
when you get to ordinary politics, things at, do that at that point of time were not manageable as much as constitutional politics. If that's true, then you get all the time that you get. My question to you is, one, does this mean that the PhDs are in any way affected by the doctrine of the Indian question? Because if the objective of that principles was at the end of the day to convert something from constitutional politics to ordinary politics, uh, would they attract the doctrine of the Indian question, thereby questioning the use of the PSPs as interpretive devices? If they were practice of politics, then I don't believe it's fair to use them to interpret any part of the system. Sure. Thanks for the questions. Um, <clears throat> so, Pritam, I think at least uh, some centripetalist theories would see deliberative institutions as a form of centripetalism to the extent, as in if, if, if I understand deliberative decision making in in the way that it's been thought of, uh, discussion-based, reason-driven, where you, um, so, so some centripetalist theorists would say that deliberative rather than interest-driven decision-making bodies are better at carrying coalitions rather than particular groups. So I would, I would think of that as a part and parcel of of centripetal decision making. Also a footnote to your, so I, I, I certainly don't claim that directive principles are a paradigm mechanism for expressive accommodation. In fact, the paradigm mechanism for expressive accommodation is a preamble. That's where expressive accommodation mainly happens and especially most jurisdictions sort out their religion problem in their preambles. You know, uh, so, it, and again, you can see the polyvocality as well. So the Pakistani Constitution's preamble, for example, in the same breath declares it as an Islamic state, but the very next clause also talks about uh, the guarantee of religious freedom of, of religious minorities, right? So preambles are, are the key expressive vehicle, which is why there's so much premium put on whether socialist is in the constitution, in the preamble or not, et cetera, right? So uh, yeah, directive principles. This is another idea in the paper that, I, that did not come out in the talk, which is the idea of calibrated accommodation. Right? Expressive salience is something you can have more or less of. And one, one of the containment strategies was to deny preambular expressive salience to any of these agendas and to put them instead in the directive principles in the hope that the expressive salience will be lower than might have been otherwise. Um, 
Are the dissenters being manipulated by the leaders? Manipulation is a, I, I wouldn't use the word manipulation. They know, they're not fools. The debates are very clear about all of this, right? They know what they're getting, and they know what they're not getting, right? There are people who, who reject these solutions by saying this is peanuts, right? We've asked for the moon, we have not even taken us to the treetop. There are groups on the, the liberal slash pro-minority side, at least when it comes to the, the nationalist agenda, which oppose the directives because it's a fudge, right? So a, a, a Muslim member of the, of the assembly says, look, if you want to prohibit cow slaughter, do it. Do it clearly, right? We don't want these halfway house solutions where what you're basically doing is you're trying to make us both happy. So these guys are not fools, right? They know exactly what's going on, right? And of course the framers are trying to make everyone happy. And, and they, the idea of a compromise is that essentially nobody ends up happy or everybody's equally unhappy, right? Which is usually the most workable solution. And that's, that's what they, so not manipulation. I would, I would see them as compromises, as compromises that follow uh, deep disagreement. You should see the language used uh, in the debates by some of these um, uh, leaders against, you know, Ambedkar, of course, makes a strategic mistake in introducing, while introducing the draft constitution, he picks up, you know, the, the one agenda where all these three groups agree on is panchayats, right? The Gandhians, the socialists, and the Hindu nationalists, for variously different reasons, all want panchayats, right? And Ambedkar, early on, basically calls villages the dens of ignorance, gives a very trenchant criticism of villages, right? For three long days, they go after him for that comment, right? And I think that's, there's also some movement in it because to, by the end of the third day, you can see him shifting his position and basically realizing that this can derail the draft constitution entirely. So I don't think, look, of course, the defenders had, especially with Nehru, had the personal charisma to probably carry through the draft constitution in the back of their personal charisma. They, they knew they broadly had the numbers. But what they did not know is how they will fare in the first elections. Notice that India has never had full and fair and free elections on universal franchise. In some ways, willy-nilly, they were all in a situation of erosion veil of ignorance, right? Nobody knew their political future, including the Congress leaders. Of course, Congress is a, is a brochure. All of these debates are within the Congress and outside the Congress, right? So the political, how the political party will realign, how the political landscape will be reshaped is not clear, right? And what, what happens when you're not sure of your political future? You want to make sure that when you're out of power, you'll have something to live on, right? So what you know, winner takes all is a terrible idea for constitution making, and winner takes all usually happens when one political group is absolutely certain of its future political victories. Right? No, no such group could take that call in that time. Of course, the Congress was fairly confident, but the Congress wasn't sure it'll survive as an entity. Anyway, so that, that's my view anyway. Kagesh. Um, Doctor, so to, you have two parts to the question, constitution politics to ordinary politics. See, the decision costs at, in constitution politics are very high. So if, if a Chicago law school professor was giving this talk in econo <laughs> econometric jargon, there's a problem of, of decision costs, right? When you, have, when you have a lot at stake and deep disagreement, it's very hard for people to agree, right? Kicking the can down the road, lowers the decision cost. People find it easier to agree when they think, okay, we don't have to settle this just yet. But whether that translates into a doctrine of political question, I'm not sure. The entire constitution is a political doctrine. Fundamental rights are deeply political. You have, you have huge political disagreement. You know, fundamental rights, there's a, there's a serious argument that, that religious freedom is a consociational tool. Right? 
it is a Article 25 is a power sharing guarantee of sorts to religious minorities. So, so if if we go by that logic, I don't think any part of the Constitution will be justiciable, or courts will be able to do anything with it. I think I think the key question, and this is actually a, a question I am exploring in a new paper I'm writing more, a more conceptual paper on directive principles on on the role of courts, but I'm more interested in the role of politicians, right? What, if, what has politics done with directive principles after independence? So what has legislation done? Have statutes invoked it? Do party manifestos talk about directive principles? So I think it's clear that the constitutional intent is that they're primarily political norms. They're, they're norms that should govern primarily politicians. I don't think that rules out, um, see, I know I'm taking some time, but I want to, uh, <laughs> this, Political constitutionalism and legal constitutionalism debate as it has taken place in the US and the UK, A, it's only focused on rights, and B, it is, it is seen as a zero-sum game, where each institution's decision-making ability in this domain is seen as coming at the cost of the other institution's ability to do the same. Right? The story I'm telling in, I want to tell in the new paper is that we can think seriously about political constitutionalism without seeing it as a zero-sum game. There can be an institutional division of labor where, of course, politics has a role to play in enforcing fundamental rights, and of course, the judiciary has a role to play in directive principles. But we can, at the same time, recognize institutional primacy in each domain, or at least that's part of the constitutional design. Right? So we can. So I, I certainly don't think that the use of interpretive aids is a problem. Their enforcement by judicial fiat is more of a problem. And by the way, notice, think about the directives that have been translated into rights. Only the social rights directives. Not the distributive justice directive, and none of these controversial directives. Right? And there's a reason for that. There's a reason, this, you know, so a more sort of institutionally grounded vision of institutional capacity and relative expertise of courts and legislatures will, will better explain why that has happened. Um, Sarbani, importance of the process. So this is not an area I've studied deeply and you know a lot more about this than, than I do. What is, what is clear is that people are not holding back in the debates. That uh, deep disagreement is being expressed. And I think, I have a lot of sympathy for the idea that it, the assembly may not be democratic, but it is at some level representative of at least the dominant political currents of the time, except communism, because they, they stayed out of the process. So, so to that extent, I think there is, there, is, uh, there is some representativeness in the assembly. If, of, of course, it does not mirror the numbers that they might have had in a truly democratic assembly. But, but this is not an area I've studied or known very much about. expressed. Not just, it's not just a liberal constitutionalist model that is challenged and challenged vociferously. The legitimacy of the assembly itself is challenged time and again, right? That, that this is not a legitimate forum for doing this at all. We need a full adult fra universal franchise elections. There's also a path dependency. And by path dependency, I categorically do not mean the 1935 government of India Act, right? I mean the 30 years of constitutional learning that the Congress has already acquired through a long tradition of constitutional thinking, of engaging with the colonial state, of various resolutions. Right? And, and that path dependency is extremely difficult for the party to give up. As in, I don't think there is any doubt that a Congress-dominated dominated assembly would have come out with a 
were they particularly different? If Gandhi had had joined the assembly, if he, if he had taken power, if he hadn't been assassinated, maybe he would have, we would have ended up with a different constitution. But again, we don't see that much of Gandhi in, in constitutional antecedents either, right? So the 30, so Gandhi is already constitutionally irrelevant for the Congress in the 1920s and the 30s. Right? We don't see much of Gandhi in, in those documents either. And that's, that to me is, so that, that, so marginalization of Gandhism does not happen in the late 1940s. It, it happens a lot earlier. So in the interest of those who have questions, uh, can I Please. suggest that we collect all of them and if you run out of time, then we can cast our own after it's over, just as about five minutes left. So if you have questions, Alex, Sharon. Well, thank you so much for um, both the article and the talk. I mean, this worked out incredibly well. Um, so I think the Hannah Lerner School gets us started on incrementalism as a measure for success. But maybe her weaknesses show you set examples where incrementalism works instead of looking at it where it failed. And I really like your footnote, uh, Benjamin Schumtal on Sri Lanka. I was just wondering if you could take this learning from comparing incrementalism where it succeeds, incrementalism where it fails, and what do we learn you know, from the examples in your article uh, from comparing success and failure? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, hi there. So, so uh, my question is like the uh, accommodation of ideological dissenters that you are talking about. Why, can't, why couldn't it have been simply done by making the constitution less entrenched? That is, the people who are constitutionally losing out today might, by securing a political victory in the future, will have a constitutional victory because the recent political... By making the constitution less... Entrenched. Entrenched. So the recent political discourse that we are having is that the ideological dissenters, those who dissent with certain constitutional values, are looking towards the amendment provisions of the constitution rather than building their political discourse based on directive principles. Alex, so thank you for pointing out Ben Chantal's work, which for the people who don't know, uh, the work is on Buddhism in Sri Lankan constitution, and his main thesis is that um, the accommodation of, of Buddhism in the constitutional text in Article 8, I believe, which basically, it does not establish Sri Lanka as a Buddhist state, but it says Buddhism shall have the foremost place in Sri Lanka. Ben Chantal's thesis is that actually led to more uh, religious conflict and strife than less. A, it has the problem of counterfactualism. But B, notice the distinction between the Indian way of incrementalizing it. So the Sri Lankan accommodation is completely uncontained. You put the broad principle, Buddhism, the ideology in the constitution, not one agenda, not in any contained manner, right? Also, you upfront it after the first 10 constitution, co constituting articles of the state, articles 1 to 10, article 11, or it's either 8 or 11. It's quite early on, so deep expressive salience. So I think the, solution, the answer is that you can do this well and you can do it badly. And design matters in, in how, you know, imagine instead of cow slaughter if Hindutva was in the constitution, right? We would be looking at a very different constitution and that's, that's, that may be the explanation for the Sri Lankan question. Why not make it less interesting? So the Indian constitution is actually one of the least entrenched constitutions, one of the most easily amendable constitutions in the world. And in fact, um, Zachary uh, Elkins and uh, Tom Ginsburg's work on the endurance of constitutions where 
that it's quantitative work, so take it with a pinch of salt, but, but they claim, the idea, they're looking at, they're sort of basically coded and counted up all the constitutions that have ever ex existed in the world against various metrics and seen what are the features that, that are most conducive to endurance. The finding is that India, in the Indian constitution, is actually one of the best in terms of endurance uh, and design, that, that all the design features that make a constitution last are probably found in the Indian constitution. Uh, and one of the key requirements is flexibility, constitutional flexibility, ability to change. And uh, by global standards, the Indian constitution is one of the easiest to change. It's not a surprise because in one of the responses of the assembly to its lack of perceived legitimacy was easy amendability. Like, okay, we are not legitimate, and therefore we are not going to tie up future leaders too tightly. Right? More democratic future governments will have the capacity to change this constitution with relative ease. And uh, of course, the basic structure doctrine has complicated that picture in a deep way, but that wasn't uh, the, the founding um, idea. Relevance of directive principles when the, um, so again, this is the, in the new paper that I'm working on, having, having just sort of dissed con quantitative research, I counted up all the statutes passed since independence, which in their preamble or a provision invoke directive principles either generally or, or a particular directive. And, and I think the last on, I've, I've reached about 131 statutes. Um, the, and not all statutes do, right? So a lot of direct statutes that directly concern a directive, a lot of them are counselor, don't even mention a directive, right? So this, this is still a conservative estimate, right? They're spread throughout, so they, it sort of picks up from the 60s, concentrated in the 70s for reasons you can immediately guess, but does not end in the 70s, right? This in, statutory invocation of directive principles continues until this day, right? So what's going on here? That needs an explanation. Why, why are directives playing? Party manifestos continuing to evo invoke directives, right? So politicians clearly see a value in invoking them and, and, and getting some constitutional legitimacy to rub off on, on their agenda, right? So if you ask the relevance question only from a very legalistic point of view, then who knows? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, and I, I think there are some legal relevance as well. But I think the, the political relevance of of directives is, is, a, is a hugely under-researched area, and I think there is a story to be told there. Thank you very much. Very quickly, to close it off, thanks very much, Pip and Tarun, for your thought and your time. Um, the audience will be spared of the ritualized scarf gifting ceremony because it has already taken place when uh, an MOU was signed between General Global Law School and Melbourne Law School earlier in the morning. Uh, thanks also to Alex and Shorbani from the Center for Constitutional Law Studies for organizing this and to Sean and Drubo from the Australia India Studies Center for helping with the organization as well and to all of you for coming and your time. Thanks very much.